This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, folks. Um, just taking a minute or two just for delegates to join the call. Thank you for those who have arrived promptly. Um, just aware that people are just dashing in and going to join the call. Um, but you are in the right place if you've uh, come to join the Cardiff University lunchtime webinars for community oncology. Um, today we're doing an update on managing and diagnosing urology cancers with specifically a view to early prostate cancer. Nice to see some names on the attendees list who have been to other meetings as well this this series. Um, it's good to have you with us and to, uh, you know, obviously worthwhile if you're coming back, but also to get your feedback from them about what you'd like for the next set as well would be great. Um, I'm aware that delegates have got quite a lot to say to you today. So, uh, sorry, the panellists. So um, I'll probably just get the uh, meeting up and running because we can always, um, you know, catch up with with people who are arriving later on down the line. So a quick welcome from um, those of us who've been organising it. Um, I'm Elise Lang, I'm a GP in Cardiff, but also work in Berlinger one day a week. I've been working with colleagues, um, Dr Fiona Rawlinson and Dr McButton, who are both um, uh, working in Berlinger and City Hospice. Um, and Fiona Rawlinson is also um, a um, educational postgrad um, doctor at Cardiff University. Charlotte Stevenson will be the person who's been sending you out all the emails to get you all safely into this meeting. Um, and so if we go on to the next slide, please. Today, we've got um, a number of speakers from um, Belindra and Cardiff University Hospital. So we've got Kerry Morris, who's a urology CNS in um, Cardiff University Hospital. Um, Shri, who's Dr. Shri, sorry, who's one of the um, oncologists in Belindra. And um, Lauren, it's upgraded you to a doctor on this, but Lauren James, who's one of the, um, you, uh, Oncology, Urology, CNS is in Belindra and myself and um, Dr. Button are also on the call. Um, thank you. We've got a couple of um, polls just to launch about where you are and what roles you do. Um, Charlotte, if you're okay just to launch those, just to show if, if you're attending this as a delegate, could you just please just tick um, where you, what role you're doing, sorry, is on that first part. Or just so we've got a bit of an idea of who the audience is. Thank you. Um, lovely. So again, so far we've got GPs and GP trainees, palliative care and nursing colleagues on the call. I know that with these, we've had quite a lot of people attend online subsequently with quite a lot, a lot of pickups from the recordings. Charlotte, there's another poll as well. I think there's three, aren't there in total? So yeah, just whereabouts do you mainly work? Where's, where's your main role? Thank you. And the final one, so yeah, so mainly in the community, which is great. And we've got one specialist palliative care person on the call. The last one is just whereabouts in the world are you? Are you local to us in South Wales or um, elsewhere around and about? I know with Cardiff Uni's um, extensive reach and the fact this is virtual, you could be attending from far and wide. So we're keen to hear from where you are. Thank you. To all Welsh delegates at the moment. It may be that online, some of the audience who watch and the catch up um, for the panelists' sake will be um, international or um, across the British Isles. So, um, obviously, just um, with discussing local referral guidance and, and pathways and stuff in, in South East Wales, it may be appropriate to ask your local resource and local specialists if there's something similar where you're working. But without um, holding up any further, I'm going to pass um, to Kerry Morris, who's um, kindly offered to speak today and is one of the CNS's. Um, clinical nurse specialist in neurology in the Heath Hospital in Cardiff. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks very much, Elise. Thanks for inviting me along today. So my name is Kerry and I am the urology lead CNS for the team here in UHW. Um, so this is where most of your referrals would come um, 
through the USC or single cancer pathway, they tend to find us uh, themselves sorry, into our office. So I thought we would talk a little bit about referral and diagnosis. But before we do, just some little uh, facts about prostate cancer. So I I'm sure most people know this first one that most commonly diagnosed cancer in men in the UK and currently is accounting for about 27% of male cancers with more than 52,000 cases diagnosed each year and the incidence of prostate cancer as with many other cancers is projected to rise quite substantially but fairly recently Prostate Cancer UK uh, released a statement suggesting that there were about 14,000 men currently living with undiagnosed prostate cancer largely as a result of the um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so obviously that's quite a lot of men out there who potentially need to find their way through to, um, to our services. But it's not all bad news because prostate cancer overall has a good survival with about 78% surviving more than 10 years. Inevitably, there are some prostate cancer deaths amounting to about uh, just over 12,000. Thank you, Shri. Um, so uh, talking about the, the sort of referral into the services, the majority of our referrals come through with raised PSAs um, and fairly recently NICE have changed the uh, PSA threshold so on the right hand side of the screen there you can see the previous PSA thresholds from 2019 um, and then on the left hand side we've got the latest uh, age specific thresholds so um, as you can see there there's a, a, a few extras added in uh, more recently and these have been accepted as a, an all way um, uh, referral criteria now since April and they have all been updated on Welsh Clinical Portal to show when um, when PSA results are abnormal. Um, you can see the biggest difference is in the 60 to 69 year old uh, men for whom now a PSA of up to 4.5 is considered to be normal whereas previously PSA should have been less than three. Um, so next slide please Shri. Thank you. Um, the referral criteria that we have here in UHW for USC is um, either a single raised PSA above 10 after a year analysis to exclude UTI or two consecutively elevated PSA tests, but they should be taken four to six weeks apart and a UTI ruled out. And that's just to uh, try and negate the transient causes of raised PSA. And we do also recommend that patients adhere to the rules of abstaining from any sexual activity and also um, avoiding any um, strenuous exercise, particularly cycling for 48 hours before their PSA blood test. I think lots of men don't, don't know about that. Um, we also accept referrals for patients with abnormal malignant feeling prostates with a normal PSA. So there's a little um, diagram on the right there, apologies, it's eaten into some of my words. Um, so the, the top two left hand and middle uh, diagrams are obviously abnormal DRE and the bottom middle one as well. Um, we do get a lot of referrals from um, primary care uh, with abnormal DRE that's that's perhaps not um, malignant as such. So um, things like palpable nodules, craggy surfaces, a, a bony consistency of the prostate, that's the sort of thing that we're looking out for. And I think really importantly as well, the patient needs to know about what's going to happen to them next they need to be willing to undergo ongoing investigations so an MRI scan and possibly prostate biopsies um, if they aren't willing to undergo those investigations then that that leaves us with little option but to remove them from the um, single cancer pathway um, next slide please Shri thank you um, so really important to counsel the patients pre-PSA tests. We do have um, a fair few referrals for patients that come through. They don't even know they've had the blood test done. Um, and that happens for all sorts of different reasons. And I'm well aware that pre-electronic forms, patients used to just tick boxes randomly on blood tests to, to get more tests done. So, um, but, you know, I think if they know what the PSA test is for, um, then, then that's really helpful. 
so for patients under the age of 75, we would arrange a direct to test MRI scan um, and that would be done prior to the patient being seen in the, uh, in the nurse led prostate cancer clinic. Um, so uh, patients are contacted by somebody from our administrative team to go through the, um, the sort of protocol questions for the MRI and they're given a, an appointment. Within a week, we have our lists on a Saturday. Um, so we try and get those done sort of the Saturday of the week that the referral comes through. And then we, um, we see the patients then uh, the following week. So the patients are booked in at the same time to a, a nurse-led clinic appointment where they will undergo some sort of regular clerking, um, sort of ask them about their medical history, um, about their family history. Uh, they have a, a prostate examination. They also do a flow rate test and, and we do some post-void residuals. And we assess their urinary symptoms using an IPSS um, scoring system. Uh, from that appointment then we sorry <laughs> thank you we um we discuss their mri findings uh, so any patients who have a a pyrads three four or five we recommend that they have prostate biopsies because of their risk of clinically significant cancer um, on the right hand side there you can see the the graph this is from the promise trial that represents the the portion of patients who will have clinically significant cancer dependent on their pyrad scoring so you can see that um significantly increases for pyrads four or five but is is about 45 percent for pyrads three patients too um, we do currently run both transperineal and transrectal prostate biopsies although we are currently undergoing some problems obtaining the um, necessary equipment for transperineal service and we are recruiting to the translate trial which is trying to determine whether there is any significant difference in cancer detection between the two biopsy approaches because we already know that transperineal biopsies are safer there's the the sepsis risk is very much less but unfortunately we've had to suspend recruitment to that until the the national shortage of equipment required for transperineal biopsies has um has been resolved next slide please Shri. thank you so following the biopsies, patients then will come through the nurse-led prostate cancer diagnosis clinic. Um, we can run this clinic face-to-face -face or virtually. It was always pre-COVID done face-to-face -face, and I was very passionate about keeping it that way um, because I thought that that was better for the patient. But actually, because of of the COVID pandemic where we all had to make a huge change to our practice and most of our, our um, appointments were done virtually. We had some really good feedback to suggest that patients quite liked um, being at home and receiving their, um, their results by telephone. They were uh, sort of in a, a comfortable room with their family members if, if they wanted them there and they didn't have to walk out of the clinic and, and back to their car afterwards. So we do offer the patients both options now and, and they can choose which they prefer. I think as a nurse, it's very much easier to do a face to face appointment with somebody. Quite often I've not met these patients before um, uh, because of the um, the different banding within the team um, and the appropriate roles, it, it wasn't felt that uh, band six nurses should give um, cancer diagnosis, which I think is probably reasonable. Um, but I don't have time to see all of the patients in the raised PSA clinic. So inevitably, I've not met quite a chunk of them at that appointment. Um, but we, we get through it. The patients who have a positive cancer diagnosis or the patients with a PIRADS 3, 4 or 5 lesion all get listed for MDT discussion um, where it's decided um, those with negative biopsies whether or not they need any ongoing hospital-based follow-up or whether they can be discharged to primary care with um, PSA re-referral criteria usually based on PSA density. Um, the patients with a positive prostate cancer diagnosis then will um, come back to the consultant clinic to make a treatment decision. I think it's really important that that decision is made collectively with the patient. Um, we, we obviously would uh, 
distinguish whether there is any um, any treatment that wouldn't be suitable. But largely, those patients are, are making a decision between um, active surveillance, uh, robotic prostatectomy or radiotherapy for the low and intermediate risk prostate cancers, high risk prostate cancers or metastatic cancers tend to be um, more hormone therapy and oncological treatments. And all through that process, the, the nursing team are there to support and signpost the patients. We allocate a key worker once the patient has had a positive diagnosis. And we do try to encourage patients to, to make contact with the team if they do have any concerns or anything that they want to ask at any point. So I think that's about it from, from me. I'm going to hand over to Sheree now, who's going to talk about treatments for um, prostate cancer. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, uh, ho hopefully, everyone can hear me well. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to yeah, sort of reduce that screen. So hopefully that's done. And uh, yep, my name is Dr. Srijit. I'm one of the consultant oncologists at Belinda Cancer Center, uh, practicing um, with uh, urology cancers. And uh, just going to take you through some of the treatment aspects which uh, Kerry mentioned. And uh, Oops, sorry about that. So these are my references, and I'll get, get each one of them. So uh, the first thing, as uh, Kerry uh, mentioned, once we go through the biopsy process and we've sort of uh, had the discussion at the MDT, one of the main things that we discuss at the meeting is with regards to placing these patients in a particular risk group and how we determine the risk group is purely based on three main criteria. The first one being the PSA level. The second one being both the clinical, uh, by clinical, I mean uh, what the urologist feels on the DRE examination and also the radiological uh, stage, which is based on the MRI, uh, again, which Kerry mentioned, and also the biopsy results, which gives us something called the Gleason score and most recently, we've adopted something called the grade group uh, with regards to Gleason. Again, not going on deta uh, further details, but this is the three main signs, we, uh, three main uh, sort of criteria we look out for. Now, this was, um, if, you, if you see the re uh, risk grouping now, historically, we uh, used this particular risk group, which was simple enough as low, intermediate, and high risk. And this was based on a paper uh, from the American group, that's the uh, D'Amico uh, paper, which um, uh, I mentioned, it's it's pretty simple in that the PSA, which is um, sort of a low Gleason uh, tumor stage and PSA stage. More recently, though, obviously we have had uh, many versions of this come through, and this is the most recent one, again adapted from the uh, NCC uh, risk criteria. And as you can see, uh, essentially it's still the same in that it's low, intermediate, and high risk. But obviously, we have sort of added on more groups in that there's a very low risk uh, cancer and there is a very high risk cancer. Now, of interest, again, the ones that we commonly uh, encounter in clinic is this intermediate risk group. And that, again, uh, to make it com complicated for both the surgeons and the oncologists, they've divided that into favorable and unfavorable. Now, obviously, it's not just for the complexity alone, it's because of the sort of clinical differences and outcomes which these patients have. So again, this is again based on certain high-risk uh, uh, criteria as I've just highlighted there, one being the uh, stage which is T2B to C, grade group two or three, and PSA 10 to 20. Um, right, now, uh, more recently though, uh, we have uh, in the UK particularly, we have adopted this newer sort of risk uh, stratification criteria called the CPG or the Cambridge Prognostic Group, which is again uh, based on a paper that came out in 2016. Now, this again divides it into five risk groups. And uh, as you can see here, it's a bit more clearer with the Gleason score, the PSA levels, and the stage. Now, obviously, based on this criteria, that's the CPG group one, two, three, uh, which, uh, which group the patient falls into, do we then decide as to what, what treatment uh, would best suit them going forward? Again, this is uh, based on the National Prostate Cancer Audit, which kind of validated this CPG risk grouping with the sort of historical 
standard, which I mentioned previously, was the DM eco grouping and the NCCN grouping. And as you can see here, most of our CPG1 criteria, that's what we would call as low risk previously, but there is a slight sort of overlap between the low risk and intermediate risk group. And uh, this is something which I found quite interesting. Now, that said, though, the high risk or locally advanced, more often than not, a CPG4 and a CPG5 group usually falls into that group there. It's more of the intermediate risk, which is still the sort of gray area when it comes to the behavior and so on. Now, uh, coming on to the treatment options and how we sort of end up counseling patients. Now, this was uh, one of the sort of, I'd, I'd say a breakthrough study, which, um, uh, which, which looked at uh, three modalities actually two main modalities, which is surgery and radiotherapy, and the other part where can we actually do something called active surveillance for prostate cancer patients. So basically the question they were asking is, many men do not uh, die from their prostate cancer and we tend to overtreat a lot of early stage cancers. Now that is highlighted in this beautiful graph as shown here, where if you, again, uh, all these, it's a, it's small, which so what what is seen in the, with the dark blue is men actually dying from their prostate cancer and men uh, in the light blue it's men dying from other diseases. Now, as you can see, with a lower Gleason group and sort of an advanced age, more often than not, men do not tend to die from their prostate cancer. They more often than not, it, it is due to other comorbidities. So we we are quite kind of over treating that cohort was the sort of basis on which they. Went, went ahead with this uh, study and trial called the PROTECT trial. Now, uh, as you can see, the baseline characteristic was well matched. It was a non-inferiority trial looking at these three arms, which is active monitoring radiotherapy and radical prostatectomy. Um, now, this is the sort of uh, Kaplan-Meier graph from the trial, which shows that there was no difference amongst the three groups with regards to prostate cancer survival at a 10-year follow-up. Although there was a difference from the disease progression, now the dotted green line, as you notice here, is the men on active surveillance while, and uh, understandably, they're the ones who tend to have more sort of evidence of disease progression compared to men who went for radical treatment, which is quite expect expected, but obviously the survival, prostate cancer specific survival does not matter in the end. Now, how do I end explain? Uh, how do I kind of explain these results to patients in clinic? Uh, so, basically, for this group, which is the low uh, sort of low low favorable intermediate risk group, we kind of explain to them that uh, if based on this trial, uh, people who did not die from prostate cancer—that's ninety-eight out of hundred person, a hundred patients on active surveillance—did uh, not die of their prostate cancer. And on the other hand, if you did have treatment, it was ninety-nine in both arms. So as you can see, there was no major difference with regards to having treatment, not having treatment from, based on the PROTECT trial. Now, as I showed in the Kaplan-Meier graph, there was this uh, sort of disease progression on, uh, on one arm. So uh, yes, uh, there is evidence that both uh, treatment with prostatectomy and radiotherapy will reduce disease progression compared with active surveillance. Uh, but in terms of numbers, it's 21 out of 100 on active surveillance and eight out of 100 patients that had disease progression in both the treatment arms. Now, uh, again, coming on to some of the side effects, again, I'm just going to briefly, uh, this is purely from the PROTECT data, and I've highlighted the ones which are sort of relevant. Now, urinary incontinence, as expected, was worse in the radical prostatectomy arm. As you can see here, it was 50 out of 100 patients on active surveillance with 69 uh, offered radical prostatectomy. This is at six years. The other one was urinary in, uh, severe urinary incontinence, which was present in 13 patients on radical prostatectomy compared to uh, almost comparable in active surveillance and radical radiotherapy. Erectile dysfunction, another problem which uh, we commonly encounter with patients having radical treatment for prostate cancer. Now, as noted here, it, it was more in the prostatectomy arm with, uh, at six months, it was 66 patients on the radical prostatectomy arm compared to 29 on active surveillance and 48 with radical radiotherapy. So again, um, radical prostatectomy being slightly worse on that front. Now, with regards to bowel function, that's the other thing which men are often worried about when it comes to treatment. And as expected, it is only mostly the radiotherapy which does affect the bowel function rather than the prostatectomy or active surveillance. But that said, it was just seen that's moderate to severe impact of bowel habits in 10 out of 100 patients on radical radiotherapy. 
So uh, based upon this sort of protect, uh, what we know from the protect trial and data, uh, this is the recommendations according to the NICE guidelines published in 2019 in that um, the CPG1 prostate cancer population, you generally want to uh, offer them active surveillance. So that's the recommendation there. Obviously, you can offer treatment if the men are desirous of the same after hearing the results of this trial, but more often than not, it comes down to active surveillance. Now, in the CPG2 uh, group, which uh, if you notice, it was mostly the favorable intermediate risk uh, population, they uh, you'd, you'd kind of give them all three options with regards to active surveillance or radical prostatectomy and um, radiotherapy, obviously giving each of this its pros and cons and merits and demerits and so on. So, uh, in a nutshell, this is what I've sort of uh, brought forward with regards to where we are with regards to the risk grouping versus what treatment you, uh, you would sort of recommend. And as you can see here, uh, active surveillance preferred in the CPG group one, which is the low, essentially the low risk prostate cancer in group two, the sort of, um, you, you kind of discuss all three options with those patients in group three, You'd, you'd be more, more in favor of treatment in that group. You'd either offer them radiotherapy with hormones or radical prostatectomy. Active surveillance generally not preferred in that group. Um, and again, the CPG4 and 5 I mentioned, these are more often than not classified as high-risk patients. And as Kerry uh, put forth uh, previously, more, more often than not, they come to us for oncological treatment. That said, though, you can still offer them surgery, but with the caveat that they might require radiotherapy. Now, uh, today, I'm just going to be speaking on the radiotherapy part because obviously that's that's what I do, and I won't be speaking much on the surg surgery bit. So um, now focusing on the radiotherapy, a uh, quick outline of what exactly is the radiotherapy pathway. It um, So first one is the patient clinical visit and consent. As Kerry mentioned, this is usually done after the patient has a discussion with the urologist and the urolo urology treatment uh, treating team. They would give them the option and explain to them regarding the surgery bit, and they sent to us, sent to us uh, to explain and counsel regarding the radiotherapy bit, and that's what we that's where we come in. Now, obviously, if they do decide to go for it, then they have something called a CT simulation scan first, which generally, how we say, happens in a week or two after the clinic visit, and then they go on to something called treatment planning, where we outline the case on a CT scan and we plan the radiotherapy with physics involved there. And finally, they get on to the radiotherapy uh, main, which uh, more often than not with radical radiotherapy these days is for 20 sessions, which is 20 fractions. And I'll get to that bit. Uh, so this is the sort of photograph of a machine that we commonly use for prostate cancer radiotherapy. That's the external beam radiotherapy bit. Uh, again, more often, uh, again, uh, if people aren't aware, radiotherapy is high energy x-ray. So that's the main thing we clarify with patients as well in that it is just x-rays. It is a non-invasive painless treatment. And that's the main thing to highlight to the patients. Um, so, and, and you won't be radioactive. That's the other question which we, we, people have. Now, um, what exactly do we do with radiotherapy? Again, uh, that's highlighted in these two scans here. Now, these are two CT scans showing uh, the different modalities of radiotherapy. And these, this is over the years. Initially, we use something called 3D conformal radiotherapy. And more uh, as, as the radiotherapy treatment uh, treatments have advanced, uh, you can see here, we, we then started using something called intensity modulated radiotherapy, which is called IMRT. And as you can see here, it just gives lower dose to the surrounding organs there on that cut axial section. And uh, more recently, we've gone to a bit more conformal technique known as the volumetric arc technique or VMAT treatment, which uh, as you can see here, it's, uh, it's very, very conformal and avoiding radiation and all to the surrounding structures. Now, what is the sort of uh, evidence for the radiotherapy and what we follow right now? Now, this was one of the main papers that came out from the, uh, mainly from the UK group, which was a multi-center phase three trial, which looked at what would be the sort of optimal dose. Can we give something called hypofractionation in radiotherapy? Again, sorry if, it, if it's getting a bit more technical, but I thought I'd just uh, highlight what uh, what is the evidence based on which we kind of determine the current radiotherapy dose. And what it showed was uh, 60 gray in 20 fractions, and that's what we use at the moment for external beam radiotherapy, was found to be non-inferior compared to the standard uh, control, which earlier was 74 gray in 37 fractions, which people have been uh, sort of using previously. And therefore, this was 
uh, sort of implemented as the sort of standard practice in with regards to what you would recommend as a dosage in external beam radiotherapy. And that's what we use currently with 60K and 20 fractions. Now I'll quickly highlight uh, some of the other types of radiotherapy I'm aware of the time, uh, uh, it won't take much. So one of them, again, which uh, you would have heard uh, people mention is prostate brachytherapy. Now, uh, just a caveat here, what I'm going to describe right now is just this high dose rate brachytherapy. Previously, we did use something called low dose rate brachytherapy with seed implant. I'm not going to go through that because that in, in itself is an entire session with radiation protection and so on. So at the moment, we use something called high dose rate brachytherapy, which basically, in, uh, which is, as you can see, done for mainly these uh, low risk patients who fit this particular criteria that I've mentioned here. And I've also mentioned the exclusion criteria, which we look out for. And as Kerry mentioned, they do this baseline uh, urine flow rate and IPSS score. And obviously, if the patient isn't suitable based on that, we wouldn't recommend brach brachytherapy. Uh, when it comes to counseling these patients for brachytherapy in sort of uh, what is the advantage and disadvantage compared to external beam radiotherapy. The main thing, as you can see here on the slide and template, is that the brachytherapy is uh, sort of a quicker treatment in that you just require two sessions of brachytherapy compared to those 20 sessions of external beam radiotherapy and coming into Belindra. So that is one of the advantages as highlighted here. Now, it, it, it does look, it, it looks a bit uncomfortable and sometimes to patients it is uncomfortable, but obviously this is done under anesthesia and it uh, involves implant catheters uh, put in directly into the prostate gland. And then we do something called the CT scan to do uh, a, a plan. And after the plan is set, uh, there is a radioactive source which then passes through the implant catheter, straightening the prostate, going out. And then the catheters are removed and the patient is sent out home. So that in a nutshell is the brachytherapy process. And the main advantage, as you can see here is, here, is we can treat the prostate with a pretty good dose of radiotherapy without giving uh, uh, significant doses to the surrounding organs, which you might do more so in external beam radiotherapy. So that is sort of uh, the main sort of uh, advantage and why we would recommend brachytherapy to that cohort of patients who are fit for the same. Uh, again, Quick, a quick word on antigen deprivation therapy. This might be something uh, in the community you must have seen in letters that come from us where we, oh, sorry, uh, where we give this uh, ADT along with radiotherapy. Now the basis, basis being that, uh, again, prostate cancer is very sensitive to testosterone, testosterone hormone, and therefore we want to suppress that hormone. And the common agents that we use are cosarillin and luprolide mainly in our clinical practice. Uh, in certain cases, we also use Jega Relics, which is an LHRH antagonist. Again, I've mentioned the trials which have shown benefit in that. I'm not going to uh, explain on that. But based on this, in a nutshell, we recommend four to six months of androgen deprivation therapy in those low and intermediate risk prostate uh, sorry, intermediate risk prostate cancer and low even intermediate risk prostate cancer patients, and two to three years of ADT treatment in high risk prostate cancer patients. Again, a uh, quick word, another thing which we do use for the high-risk prostate cancer patients is a new, is a drug called abiratrone, and that was based, the evidence for that comes from uh, a recent trial called the Stampede trial, again, which was a large multicenter trial uh, done in the UK. Uh, as you can see here, that's the sort of uh, baseline characteristics of the patients there, and there was a significant, uh, and, and the Kaplan Mayer showed that the failure free survival was better in the patients with non metastatic disease uh, on abiratrone. And it's on this basis we kind of uh, recommend abiratrone as well in that high risk. Again, I'm not going to the details of that because that will just uh, prolong this <laughs> talking further. Now, uh, again, coming on to a, a quick word on the side effects. Obviously, Lauren's going to be um, explaining more on this now. What, what, what to tell patients with regards to side effects. Now, when uh, with the hormones, the hormone therapy being the androgen deprivation therapy mentioned, uh, you would counsel regarding fatigue, weight gain, hot flushes, impotence, osteoporosis, and possible cardiac risk. Again, that is something to be mindful of, especially when you are prescribing androgen deprivation therapy. When it comes to radiotherapy, the side effects being uh, fatigue, again, tiredness. Uh, the tattoo marks, which again, we put during daily therapy, which is small, it's not as big. <laughs> it's it's just a small mark, but yep, that's something you have to mention. This title is diarrhea, um, risk of impotence again, which becomes important, especially in the younger patients when you come to decide treatment in them, and again, the small risk of second malignancies and long-term risk of uh, bladder and bowel damage. 
a quick word on the newer modalities and run. So basically things that are sort of in the pipeline and coming up slowly in prostate cancer. This one mainly to reduce the side effect of radiotherapy, as you can see here. This is something called the space OER gel. Uh, I think it was recently approved for use in the UK and we're slowly introducing this in Wales as well, where we introduce this uh, hydrogen spacer between the rectum and the prostate when we treat with radiotherapy. And as you can see over here, it just gives us more space between the <clears throat> sort of prostate and uh, anterior wall of the rectum, and it just reduces the side effect to the rectum. So there's been trials in the US which have shown benefit with this and uh, yeah, hope, hoping to introduce this in, in, in our practice in the, uh, in the near future. Again, what next in terms of radiotherapy, and this might be something you might hear more, more of wherein we're going from 20 fractions to five fractions. We're just reducing the uh, sort of uh, duration of radiotherapy. There are two trials ongoing for this. One was the HypoRT trial, which has, which was mainly based in Europe, it's finished recruitment, awaiting uh, results from the same. Phase B trial, again, which was done in the UK, finished recruitment, awaiting uh, results from the same. But so far, both of them have shown uh, good outcomes, and we're hoping that this might be a direction forward when it comes to uh, what next in terms of prostate cancer. I won't go through pivotal boost again. It's uh, it's a bit uh, it's it's more it's, it's actually looking at increasing the dose by giving more dose to the sort of uh, tumor within the prostate, and that's what the pivotal boost trial is looking at, and which is currently recruiting, and we do counsel patients for that as well. Patients who do fit the eligibility criteria for the pivotal boost trial. Uh, quick word on proton therapy again. Uh, it's not like Proton therapy is one of the treatment options for prostate cancer, but at the moment, it's not licensed for routine use in prostate cancers in the UK. Why? Because there have been many trials which have shown that there's no benefit of proton therapy compared to standard sort of uh, radiotherapy. But as you can see here beautifully in the plants with proton therapy, you can completely avoid those to the surrounding organs. But, but in the process, unfortunately in this space, there's no benefit. There has there hasn't been uh, shown any particular benefit compared to standard radiotherapy. So uh, I thank 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 uh, thank you all, and I will uh, I'll introduce Lauren next to uh, continue with the talk. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lauren. I'm one of the uh, urology CNSs in Belinda here. Um, I have actually only been here for about nine weeks, but um, prior to that, I did work and um, carry in UHW uh, for about 16 months, and I've got a 13 sort of year history uh, working in Singleton within the cancer centre there. So we are a team of um, four nurses, uh, myself, Sean, and um, two of our sexes. Um, so we are very much here for, for patients and to be um, sort of in a supportive role for them. We all take um, sort of part in government in the management of, of patients, so localised prostate cancer patients, given that we cover four tumour sites. Um, therefore, a lot of our clinics with, with these patients are sort of via telephone. So today I'm just going to go through some of the side effects that will be associated um, with radiotherapy. Um, I won't go into too much detail about hormone therapy because I think you know we'll just focus on the sort of the brain therapy aspects. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I, I'm going to outline the side effects from brain therapy and just discuss the management of these side effects. So urinary um, bowel symptoms, obviously, um, a little bit on erectile dysfunction as well. So for us, you. In Valindra, um, a lot of our patients um, get followed up in a, a six monthly review, a nurse led review following radiotherapy treatment. And you know, patients can have a combination of brachytherapy, uh, brachy boost, which is external radiotherapy and brachytherapy, um, or just um, external beam radiotherapy on their own. Uh, prior to this appointment, sorry, <laughs> prior to this appointment, um, patients um, are asked if they want to go through what we call a health needs assessment. So on that, a set of questions where we holistically assess patients. So not just looking at the physical um, symptoms and obviously I think financial, the psychosocial implications of the cancer diagnosis as well. Anything that's sort of triggered on that, our Macmillan Neurology Cancer Navigator then can go through with them. If there's anything that they can sort of do to help the patient, they will. Um, and any further advice then that is more sort of nurse-led, they'll um, sort of um, ask us to sort of follow up the patient in that initial consultation six months down the line. 
Next slide, please. Um, so I think Sri touched a little bit on this, but this is the follow-up protocol that we follow as nurses here. Um, so obviously we group them in uh, low intermediate risk cancer patients, high risk patients, and obviously the very high risk patients. But these are all these have all still got localized disease. Um, as you can see, the low intermediate risk prostate cancer patients, they are discharged to the GP at two years. Um, bearing in mind that you know their PSA has dropped, and sometimes you know after radiotherapy, PSA can take about 18 months for the PSA to come right down to that nadir level. Um, and patients do continue to have lifelong annual PSA readings as well. High risk patients um, stay with us for a maximum of about five years. We can then discharge the GP at that five year period. Um, very high risk patients stay with us lifelong. So just to mention a little bit, I know probably for some of the GPs on this um, sort of talk, they may be um, aware of our PSA self-management program, which we're about to pilot in Belindra. So this is about really trying to um, sort of give back a bit of, um, sort of autonomy to patients and help them sort of looking at improving survivorship initiatives um, following their cancer treatment. So this is in, in itself um, like a tracker program. Um, which will, you know, patients will have access to their own PSA test results. They can um, sort of contact the clinical team through this. There will also be information on there, how you know, best to support physical and emotional needs as well. Um, so this is something that will be piloted very, very soon. It's on all Wales sort of uh, basis. Um, so all health boards in Wales will be sort of taking part in this. Um, Really, I think for what this will impact on sort of us as a service, but um, on GPs as well, given that um, we'll be keeping these patients for longer. So in, in essence, the low or, or intermediate risk patients will stay on this program for a maximum of 10 years. Hence, we you know patients won't be discharged back to the GP at that sort of two-year period. Again, for high-risk patients as well, that will mean no different. They will stay on this lifelong. So to just look at um, a little bit then, obviously, um, the anatomy of the pelvis, um, if you look at the slides, you can see that the prostate is in the close proximity of the, the pelvic organs, um, it's the position at the base of the bladder, so surrounding the urethra in front of the rectum as well. So even though in sort of the aspect of um, external beam radiotherapy, even though we try and target the prostate, it's sometimes difficult to for us to um, stay right away away from the rectum. And this is why some people can sort of experience acute urinary and bowel symptoms um, after pelvic radiotherapy. Next slide, yeah. So um, just to talk a bit about some of the acute urinary symptoms post pelvic radiotherapy. So obviously radiotherapy can cause irritation and inflammation to the lining of the bladder and the urethra. Um, and this is sometimes known as radiation cystitis. So common uh, problems would be um, frequency, urgency, a burning sensation. Um, patients can get in hematuria. Um, they can experience weak urine flow or hesitancy as well. We do say that you know, for most patients, side effects can start a week or two into radiotherapy. They tend to peak um, at the fourth week. And obviously, they, they, you know, they will get worse before they can get any better. Um, but symptoms can be normally transient and settle down three to six months post radiotherapy. But we do see some patients, you know, long term who do have um, issues. So the treatment of urinary symptoms post radiotherapy. So we may ask for patients to provide a urine sample just to eliminate the UTI in the first instance. Um, we do give some advice on analgesia or anti-inflammatories to help. There are patients who do require uh, potentially an alpha blocker, which uh, in the form of something like tamsulosin to try and relax the muscles in the prostate to help them, you know, sort of boil urine a lot easy, easy, easily, and um, maybe something like solvenacin, which will help stop bladder spasms as well and reduce the feeling of urgency. We do write to the GPs quite a bit, asking them to prescribe these medications, and it's not that we're lazy. Um, we don't have any nurse prescribers in the team and sometimes access to consultants are not, is not always um, the best. So, you know, we, we do write to GPs to ask them if they can do this. And on the whole, you know, they, they do do this, which is really good. Um, on rare occasions, men sometimes are unable to pass urine. And, and for those patients who are in bracket therapy, 
um, it can sometimes lead to what we call a structure. So they may require a short-term catheter. We do give advice on fluids management to so avoid caffeine, um, alcohol, and trying to drink you know, decaffeinated products, um, drinking two liters a day. Um, we do encourage as well pelvic floor exercises and bladder training. And for those patients who've got long-term problems, uh, to consider them either a urology or continence uh, referral. So GI side effects after radiotherapy. Um, a lot of patients do get GI side effects. Um, again, um, radiotherapy can irritate the lining of the bowel and the rectum. Um, these usually start to do rain or shortly after treatment. They usually start to settle down several weeks after tri finishing treatment. But, um, you know, we do get some patients who six months, uh, maybe a year or so down the line, have got ongoing issues. And we do find that I think those people who've had bleeding through, throughout radiotherapy tend to be those patients who will have long term problems. So you can get diarrhea, constipation, um, fecal urgency leakage. And proctitis, which is bleeding or a rectal pain, um, excess wind and mucus discharge as well. And obviously this feeling of what we call a tenesmus, which is needing um, to go to the toilet and empty bowels quite frequently. So the management of bowel symptoms. So we do encourage um, patients, you know, particularly after radiotherapy, if they have got loose stools, um, maybe taken out a diarrhea. Um, obviously, analgesia as well to try to control rectal or abdominal pain. Um, there are what we call proctocidal suppositories, which can help to ease rectal pain. Um, they are um, a form of local anaesthetic and anti-inflammatory, so they will help to sort of relieve that feeling of pain in the area and help lessen the, the spasm in the back passage as well and help as well with um, low swelling, itching and uh, discharge. Um, obviously, we can use buscapan as well if patients who are feeling bloated or have abdominal distension. Um, again, laxatives for constipation. Um, we can also use stool bulk, bulking medications to increase stool bulk and uh, regulate bowels as well. Um, we do give advice as well on um, sort of dietary intake. Um, we know that um, sometimes we you know promote a healthy diet, but it's not always the best in the long term for people who have got diarrhea. Sometimes it can make things worse. Um, so you know, obviously there's two different types of fiber, insoluble and soluble fiber. So that can be dependent on in managing constipation or um, sort of helping to relieve diarrhea as well. Um, again, giving advice on um, strengthening the muscles, use of bowel control, so pelvic floor exercises. Um, and as well, I think it's important that we should review any sort of um, existing medication that patients are on. We know that things like um, antacids, uh, protein pump inhibitors, um, laxatives, things like metoclopramide can induce diarrhea, metformin as well for diabetics can um, contribute to diarrhea as well, and obviously, obviously beta blockers as well. Um, and there are medications that can sort of um, cause more constipation. So things like opioids, which you know people are aware of, and Dantatron, iron tablets as well. So for those patients who have got um, long-term side effects, have bowel side effects, um, we do say that you. Know, Possibly they need to refer to gastroenterology. Um, so we, I think we need to um, quantify if they are experience, experiencing blood loss, quantify how, you know, this blood loss and the frequency of it. Um, but perhaps they may want an FBC or ferritin to assess the severity. We may advise transamic acid. Um, there is, what we can use is such superfit enemas. These can be helpful, although sometimes um, they use off license, so they can be a bit problematic in terms of prescribing them. They tend to be specialist initiated as well. For Cardiff patients, um, we has been really good that for us as nurses, we've been able to um, refer patients within that facility to um, a late GI effects pelvic radiation clinic, which is based in Clandoc. Um, there is an endoscopist over there, Rachel Edwards, who's, who's very good. Um, she will review the patient, uh, in some cases carry out a colonoscopy and then follow the patient up 
Um, but like I say, that is only for Cardiff patients. But I think the service is predominantly used for gynae patients, but obviously um, they do um, sort of, uh, we can refer for prostate patients as well. Um, so just to quickly go through the management of um, ED. Um, I think ED is an issue that is not addressed enough um, and can have a massive impact on, on the patient. Um, you know, we tend to focus a lot on urinary side effects and um, bowel side effects, but as new says, I think this is something that we predominantly address. Um, and I think historically, the ED pathway has always been provided by the CMS um, in terms of reviewing oral medications. Um, and I think really the pathway starts at the point of um, decision of treatment, really. Um, so I think it, we need to get into the situation of really sort of talking to patients more. And I think that stems from the surgical side as well. You know, we have a lot of patients that come to us who have had radical prostatectomies and then are having a combination of radiotherapy and hormone treatment on top of that, which is going to just you know, exacerbate the problem. So... Obviously, prostate cancer treatments that can lead to erectile dysfunction can be radical surgery in the form of either a cystectomy or prostatectomy, a brachytherapy, a combination therapy, salvage uh, radiotherapy as well for, for patients who've um, had biochemical recurrence after um, surgery. Um, and obviously, hormonal therapy as well can reduce sex drive. Um, and we hope that you know, sometimes when treatment's completed, that it can sort of um, resolve. But this, again, can take quite a few months after uh, hormone treatment to sort of improve. So treatments that cause the problem, not the disease itself. So we can see that the fat is affecting erectile function. So it can be damaged to the cavernous nerves and the blood vessels. Um, psychological consequences of diagnosis and treatment. So this obviously has an impact, not just on the patient, but also the partner as well. So that's something I'm looking quite um, at within my sort of thesis at the moment, part of my dissertation. So, you know, it can cause um, a wide range of um, psychosocial issues, um, intimacy issues, communication issues. Um, so it's not just the physical side effects. And obviously we need to look as well at pre-existing erectile dysfunction. So there may be those patients who have cardiac disease, underlying cardiac disease, maybe didn't have very good erectile function prior to these treatments. So I think it's a matter of doing shim scores and, and various assessments to try and establish that first of all as well. So the nature of the problem. So radiotherapy can cause arousal problems, um, difficulty achieving erections, maintaining erections. Um, obviously then you can get painful ejaculation. Um, and an inability to ejaculate as well. So first line treatment options. Um, so as CNS is, we ask GPs quite a lot um, if they um, are willing to prescribe um, PD5 inhibitors as a first line treatment. So there are three at the moment that we recommend, Viagra, Levitra and Cialis. Obviously, um, these are tablets that are contraindicated in patients with unstable heart disease who are on nitrates as well. Um, so they work by increasing the smooth muscle uh, relaxation in penile arteries, which then increases the penile blood flow, and thereby um, you know, patients are able to um, gain an erection. I will say is that with the PD5 inhibitors, um, Cialis is the only one that's licensed daily to take at a five milligram dose. Um, and we do say that, you know, to patients that they do work with a bit of sexual stimulation. Um, and we do encourage as well for those patients who are on these um, to try as well um, what's called a vacuum erection device pump, which again, all sort of um, helps improve PR rehabilitation. Um, the tablets work about 30 to 60 minutes before sexual intercourse, and they sometimes last about four to five hours. The Cialis lasts up to 36 hours. We do say as well that, you know, patients should try them for at least eight doses before classing them as a failure. And we do like to go through and exhaust um, three sort of PD5 inhibitors before we look to, you know, commencing patients on other treatments. Um, so again, like I was mentioning, the vacuum erection device pump, um, cautions obviously uh, given with, these, um, with this treatment for patients who are on warfarin. Um, currently, we don't have um, a erectile dysfunction uh, clinic 
in Blindra. Um, and I know of only two specialty ED um, sort of clinics, one is in Swansea and one in the Gwent as well. Um, so this is something that I'm quite passionate about and that I want to try and develop in Belinda for our cancer patients. Um, we, are, we do have close links with our um, vacuum erection device uh, pharmaceutical rep, who is very good. Um, and we often give his contact number to patients. So obviously we can't give patient details out because of confidentiality to him, but patients are more than willing sometimes. And we sort of explain that the pump to give him a ring and he will go through the um, sort of... Um, Get, you know, patient education on the pump and, and to go through things with them. Um, and then once he sends a report to us, then we can write to the GP and ask them to prescribe the pump. We haven't had any issues with um, sort of vacuum erection device pump prescribing through GPs. There have been on, on occasion some issues with um, GPs in, in the Gwent. Um, but on the whole, um, obviously these um, this pump needs to be prescribed on an SLS basis um, from the um, National formulary. Um, obviously, second line um, options then are what we call interleukin creams. Um, one is um, one is actually a pellet called Mousse, or the other one is the Tarot, which is, is is more of a cream. Um, again, this is these need to be initiated within a specialist ED service, which we don't have in Belindra. Um, their sort of effectiveness is sometimes a bit hit and miss. Um, they involve inserting through the into the penis down into the urethra. Um, side effects of this can include um, some urethra burning as well, but they are tend to be less effective than injections. And then another option then is, like I said, intracavernoxal injections. There's one called Cabaject, and there's another one called Invacorp. I think um, with Cavaject um, is much more patient friendly. Patients can administer this in themselves. Um, obviously, they're not advisable for patients with sickle cell or a history of a priapism. Again, caution should be given with warfarin. And side effects with these um, include a priapism, which for those people who don't know is a prolonged er erection more than four hours. They can also cause fibrosis as well. But again, these need to be initiated through a specialist ED service so that we can teach patients how to use them. Um, they shouldn't be used more than uh, once in the 24 hour period, uh, and no more than three times a week. Um, obviously, again, you know, patients need to be you know, educated on how to use them. So lastly, um, when we discharge patients to the GP, we do sort of emphasize to the patient that it is their responsibility to arrange an annual PSA blood test. Um, for all patients, PSA blood tests are lifelong and annually. Uh, we do, like Shri said, advise patients um, that there is a very small risk of developing a second pelvic malignancy after radiotherapy to the prostate. This usually occurs you know, 10 years more after treatment and there's less than 1% chance. We do advise GPs then on um, a PSA threshold level and we just charge them back to them. Um, and normally that is at uh, an ideal level. So say somebody's PSA is undetectable after treatment, so below 0.1, it would be then sort of um, two nanograms above that. Any significant rises in PSA or any worsening neurological um, symptoms, um, any bone pain lasting more than six weeks. And that's it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much to all the speakers today. What a fascinating um, trip through uh, various areas of urological cancer management. I'm aware of time. We've got a couple of minutes left, but we do have actually quite a lot of questions that come in, in the chat. Um, Kerry, the first couple are to you. I'll just read them out together. Um, one of them was, will phone appointments continue or do you think appointments will go back to face to face? <laughs> um, I think we're doing a bit of a hybrid. I think patients, um, whatever the patient wants, really. We've proven um, we can do phone appointments. Lovely. That's how I understood it as well. And then a question about what happens if primary care submit a USC referral and the urology team uh, to the urology team after a single age related raised PSA of less than 10. And then there's a normal urinalysis. So when you've only had one raised PSA under 10, what would happen then? So they should be rejected 
on the e-referral system by the vetting consultant with a note to say to repeat four to six weeks um, after the UTI. Uh, sorry, sorry, not after the, the, PSA, yeah. the patient hasn't got you yet. Yeah, repeat four to six weeks. I think there's another question a little bit further down asking about yeah. um, UTI and the time window. So, yeah, absolutely. So four weeks after treatment of the UTI. Thank you. Um, and I think that that just is about the responsibility of primary care to follow it up, isn't it? I suspect is where that question is coming from. But I think that question is for another day, you know, the further sort of um, longevity of that. Um, so I think um, the question about age related side effects um, to do with um, erectile dysfunction and incontinence. I don't know who wants to take this. So is, is there any data on is it more likely that you're going to get side effects the older the, man, the male is that's treated in terms of erectile dysfunction or incontinence? Shri, do you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, um, so generally that's 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 partly true. So uh, what, what because what happens is that as uh, Lauren rightly mentioned, it's not just the radiotherapy alone. More often than not, it's the hormone therapy as well, which plays a an important role in causing ED for men. And uh, uh, hormone therapy obviously suppresses the testosterone hormone. The testosterone recovery is a lot more sluggish in older men compared to uh, younger men upon stopping hormone therapy. So sometimes even the six to 12 month time, time frame, which uh, Lauren mentioned after hormone therapy might not be enough to uh, sort of uh, bring back their uh, and, and they just, uh, they face other side effects as well, not just ED, they would have hot flushes, fatigue, tiredness. Um, yeah, I just tell them, listen, you're going to have something called a male menopause. That's what I describe it to them as having hormone treatment. So, uh, yeah, and it's, it's one of those things where uh, more often than not, when we discuss erectile dysfunction, when it comes to consenting for older men, they, they tend to say, doc, it doesn't, it doesn't impact me. That's the first answer I normally hear. But that said, there are men in whom they, yeah. they are desirous. Of, yeah. And then, Shri, another couple of questions just about the trials you've mentioned. So um, a question about where can we get more information on the pivotal boost trial? And then a, further, a later one saying, um, the PSA self-management program, I've not heard of this. Can linked details be circulated? Um, so I guess for both of those, is there any... Um, you know, links we could put in the chat or anything that would be helpful for people yeah, to, to um, sort of pick happy. up. On. So Pivotal Boost, again, uh, CRUK web, website, because it is an ongoing trial. If you uh, check check it up on CRUK website, and I can also share uh, the link for the university, that's uh, that's that's the link for health, healthcare you. professionals. So uh, the second question being, uh, sorry. I um, the PSA that. self-management, um, people haven't heard of that. They wonder whether there's more information available. Um, yeah, obviously, I've been, so I, I haven't been involved too much with this. My obviously, Sean, my colleague, has, but I know it's um, an always approach and it's been delivered by all health boards. But as yet, it hasn't been piloted. So, um, yeah, there's definitely more information out there, and I can certainly send um, links on, but um, yeah, it's not out there yet. So, I think you know, we have primary care links in all the health boards, we have a urology lead. Um, GP as well so we can get messages shared to primary care as and when there is messages to be shared so certainly don't panic yet in primary care with that one um, a quick um, request just a reminder I forgot to say at the beginning that thank you to Macmillan who have funded all these webinars and um, the cancer support charity so they are all free for attendees and we're really very grateful for that but a really you know you know heartfelt thank you to all the speakers today to Kerry to Shri and to Lauren for you know really spot on as was commented on in the chat talk for primary care you know what we needed to know and, and hopefully help you with your you know appropriate referrals and appropriate management from the community if delegates could kindly fill in the feedback um, either by the QR code or that link um, then we can send you the um, certificate for attendance and there is one more webinar left in the series which is next week and it's an update in gynecological cancer which again is going to be uh, a run through but um, lots of fascinating data to come to you there as well so thank you for your time thank you to the speakers and we'll see you again next week